Good, e good evening, everyone. This is uh, Scott Tice, VP of RARA. We're going to start here at 7 o'clock. Uh, so uh, just hang on a little bit for about five minutes, and we'll get the presentation underway. Um, when we're starting up, we'd ask that people raise their hand if they have questions. I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself. We're going to find out. If you can't, then I will be controlling the mute and unmute. But definitely keep yourself muted when uh, not speaking to avoid extra noise. So we'll be starting at seven o'clock. Hi guys, I'm happy to be here. I don't know if anyone can hear me. We can, Brian, and we're now broadcasting at this time. Okay, fine, thank you. Although as hams, we're not supposed to broadcast. <laughs> I think we call it multicast in the uh, technology, actually. Indeed. I am looking for my mic mute button. There it is. Oh. And the webcam spaces are currently being used. So there's no webcam possible for me. Okay, I think, yeah, everybody should probably pause their webcams, except for when we start here, uh, Tim. And um, I'll do mine shortly here. Uh, welcome, everybody. We'll be starting at 7 o'clock. I'm Scott Tice, Rara's VP, and uh, Tim Guyot will start up in about five minutes. You guys are looking good, gentlemen. Hi, this is Scott Tice, W2LW, RARA's Vice President. We're going to be starting here in about three minutes at uh, 7 o'clock. Hello, this is Scott Tice, W2LW, Rara's VP, and we'll be starting here in about a minute. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. When we're working here and presenting, please keep your mic muted. If you have a question or want to say something, raise your hand and I will uh, mention your name and you can unmute. If you're having trouble with that, I can unmute you here as well. And we'll be starting again in a couple of minutes.
Tim, can you hear me? Tim Guyat? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, I had to recheck in. I couldn't hear anything or talk about anything, so I went out and rechecked in. All right. Do you have me make anything about education in your setup? Yep, there's uh, three slides, your commentary on um, classes and the availability of tutoring, um, the RARA academies, and it's jumping my mind right now. Okay, well, glance at those. I've got my notes. Thanks. Hello, and welcome everybody to RARA 3T. A lot of fun. Um, so I'm going to see if I can get some certificates with that and uh, maybe a WAS I'm working on for 40 meters, 30 meters, 20 meters, and 17 meters. Um, so CW is fun with a straight key. And that's all I have. Bye. Thank you. And that's it. Oh, we got one more. Gary Ecker. Hey. Uh, Gary Acker here again from uh, down in Elmond, which is, by the way, right near Cornell, right uh, about five minutes away. Um, we have a, a couple of things this last week that I've done since uh, I'm not not going to work every day. I've been uh, working on a uh, two meter antenna on the top, on the roof. Um, used a uh, it's a J pole uh, using um, uh, the um, uh, the wire. Um, uh, what do you call it, uh, twin lead wire. And uh, I was able to uh, make a QSO with the Bristol repeater, uh, which I just uh, checked on the map is about 50, 50 miles away from, from where I am, which I think is probably a, a pretty good uh, hop for, um, for this uh, distance here. So I was pretty uh, pleased to be able to, um, to go and hit that repeater. And I know they've got a number of uh, nets on there that I'm going to be interested in, in checking out. Um, so, um, and then I did have on the HF side, it did have a contact, the first international contact this past week with a, a guy over in Italy. So that's it. Cool. Um, let's see here, we have uh, John Wit Witkowski. Hope, hope I didn't uh, put your name there. Yeah, no, you did fine. Can um, can you hear me? Yes. This is can. all this is all new to me. Um, I have to put my headset on because these eighty nine year old ears don't work too well anymore. Um, I operate just about every day now. Um, I was first licensed in nineteen sixty, and uh, for every year, every day, every week during that whole period of time up until about a year and a half ago, I was on the air very consistently. Um, then I lost my bride and I just dumped the hobby for whatever reason, it had no interest. And, uh, oh, let's see, it was back in early January, I went to one of our club meetings, a CVARA meeting in Norwich, and a couple of the guys got on my case. So I made a vow that I would operate every day, except when there's a contest on on the weekends and forget about it. But um, so I've been doing it. And except when the bands were really closed down, I've been making at least one and maybe as much as three or four contacts. And these are all CW, which is my my love. And uh, so it's great. And I'm getting back into it. I'm starting to get the love of the hobby again it it was very dampened for a while but uh, um getting over it i think and enjoying it once more so it's fine um my interest in rara goes back a little way as a buddy of mine who lived in the rochester area and you guys would have loved to have gotten his call his name was ted Fredrickson, and he was in the marine corps with me and his call that was issued by the fcc was K2ROC. His son got the call, so uh, you guys were out of luck, but I understood that there was some interest that Ra Ra had in trying to obtain it, and for the life of me, I can't understand why. 
But anyway, I'm enjoying this. I enjoy the uh, rah rah rag, and uh, you guys do a great job. And it's a very interesting club. And um, just keep up the good work. I, I appreciate all that you do for each other and how you extend yourself out into the community. So seven three and best wishes from South New Berlin. Take care. Thanks, John. Um, so Bob Arahan. That's close enough. Our Han. WB2 okay. WB2C. I'm responsible for butchering butchering names. That's why we use first names and call signs. Okay. Anyway, uh, I need some help. Uh, I think I did something to my TS440, uh, which is sitting right next to me. Uh, it in receive mode. It seems to trigger every few seconds into transmit mode. And it started up a week or so ago while I was sitting here using my handheld on two meters and uh, hasn't gone away since. The only clue I have is that if I take off the microphone, it stops triggering. So I don't know whether that's a, a clue, but if there's anyone out there who uh, knows these TS-440s uh, backwards and forwards, this one uh, is one that uh, I picked up a few years ago after uh, seeing the late Brad Allen's uh, ham shack who's, who's just down the road and uh, he talked me into picking one of these up and it's worked fine until I did something last week so uh, anyone who uh, can offer some assistance I'd appreciate it. Sounds like the Vox button is pressed. Yeah you're on you're probably on Vox uh, on the top left of the uh, unit uh, Bob there's a slide switch make sure you're in the middle position of that, which is push to talk. Uh, if you're all the way to the right, you'll be triggering your Vox and your anti-Vox may not be set properly, which is in the back of the unit. Okay, I'll get the manual out and look for it. Thank you. All right, I, this is Tim Brown. I've got your home phone number and I'm not sure if you got mine. I can give you a call tomorrow and uh, we can discuss it. That would be great, Tim, thank you. All right. Scott, you can... Go back to getting your queries there. Okay. And by the way, Tim, your video froze. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Uh, Peter, you had your hand back up again? Uh, no, I just didn't take my hand down. Oh, okay. Well, great. I think uh, we've cleared the board there, Tim. You've got some question and marks by Bill Duff and a few others. I'm not sure is that where that goes. Let me see. Oh, there's questions on a different panel that I have not seen before. <laughs> well, um, Mike, you were going to say something before. Why don't you go do that? Why take a look at this? Yeah, I was. Uh, I have a button here, and I was leaning on it. This is why I wasn't able wasn't able to get in. I was just going to talk about. Um, I've had for years a a thumb DV, and I recently uh, put it on the internet so I could use it throughout my house. And um, you know, it's it's not really radio until the last mile, at least from my house. But I've been able to um, meet some people over in Buffalo on digital, and they seem to have a lot going on over there. They've got uh, um, servers that tr can transcode from uh, the various modes. So um, I've been having some fun with that. And that is all. Thanks, Mike. Um... Go ahead, Scott. I can. You were going to start. Uh, uh, Bob was had his hand back up again. I was trying to get it back down, but Tim Brown, thank you. I think uh, that solved the problem. Okay, great. Go ahead, Tim. Oh, I was going to add that um, Brian Duff threw out there. He doesn't have a mic, but he mentioned that he made his first uh, D Star contacts this month. So. Uh, that definitely, we've heard a lot of digital stories lately, yeah. So that's just another one. Well, it's good to hear people are on the air. If we don't have any more hands right now, and I don't see any, we will continue on. Next up, club reports. We have 
a lot of local area clubs that we share members with and we consider to be our affiliates. Um, and we always give an opportunity for members of those clubs to make announcements uh, on behalf of those clubs. So if anyone wants to do so, as we have in the last few sections, just raise your hand and we'll get you unmuted. And Nobody wants to report. I see no hands. Now, if anybody has any information on um, their club that they would like me to post on the website, please let me know. Uh, I did, I have stopped putting calendar events on for right now because it seems kind of difficult to go through all the things that are happening. Uh, and I think everybody who's uh, looking at other clubs should definitely check their websites to see. It looks like some people are opening up towards the middle of July. I understand the Batavia Ham Fest is supposed to be happening. All right, with no hands raised, we'll just keep moving along. Um, Tim. Great, education. <laughs> All right, Tim Brown, education coordinator, WB2PAY. Uh, I see for the near future, we're looking at a, a, a different uh, type of training, a new view of uh, education. Uh, license classes had to be canceled at RIT. Not sure about September classes. It depends on whether RIT opens up, and uh, that's undetermined at this time. We may run, uh, if they if they are closed and we can't get into a, a venue, we may run some uh, uh, Zoom uh, or online uh, tech classes uh, and general classes if, uh, they, uh, if we can get that all organized. Um, in my... Uh, RAG uh, announcement, uh, Elmers uh, are ready to help. If you've got a, a new license and you've got a question, uh, you don't have a personal Elmer, uh, give us a call uh, at or get, send me an email at education at rochesterham.org and I'll uh, route you to uh, the right Elmer who can answer your question and help you out. Uh, I've had several questions about VE testing. According to Don Kaiser, uh, Rochester is not going to be doing VE testing in the near future. I spoke with the uh, Squaw Island uh, Amateur Radio Club, CyArc, uh, with their uh, uh, coordinator, and they plan on having VE testing at their field day site on uh, the weekend of field day. Uh, that's going to be down in Canandaigua uh, at their uh, EM, uh, EMO there their emergency management office where they hold their field day, you must, you must pre-register and have all your paperwork done ahead of time uh, before you uh, and get approved to attend. So that information, uh, I believe CyArc is listed in our rah-rah reg. I didn't give their email. We could, uh, we're likely to see a second wave of the virus. Um, so, and lastly, we don't want to compete with other organizations events that are going on later in the summer. So we've talked a bit with um, the leaders of the Rock City Net Ham Fest, and we will be present at their event, but we're, um, you know, we had a small presence there last year and we'll be a little bit bigger this year. We're gonna run our country store there, um, selling some items that were donated to RARA and we can probably do some country store stuff for members, but we're still working that out because uh, that facility doesn't have a big indoor space where we can lock stuff up for the night before. So more to come on that, but that's where we'll be. We're also not trying to take over or overwhelm their events. So, um, you know, we'll have people there, but we're gonna encourage everyone to go and attend every other ham fest that does get to, uh, to happen this year. I assume I that there would be, go ahead. Don't mind me adding in. We had talked about having a, where we don't normally have a general meeting in June that in lieu of the ham fest, because we're not having that, that we'll probably have a general meeting, but the decision I guess will be made tomorrow night. 
Yeah, that's a great question. With um, both, so the reason that we don't usually have a June meeting is because we have the Ham Fest one weekend and Tour de Cure the other, and to have our members show up for three multi-hour events in the same week is is a pretty big ask. Uh, with two of those events moved or canceled, uh, that's a different situation. So. Uh, yeah, we will discuss it, um, I guess, tomorrow night at the board meeting, and um, we'll let everybody know. Of course, it'll be posted on the website, and it'll make it into um, it'll make into it into the, the into rag, rag. which comes out just yeah. before the meeting. And this was a computer modeled variant of the G5 RV, and what I read at the time was a very in-depth study by uh, Larry LeBlanc, uh, who passed away just this past November. And he was an electrical engineer with two master's degrees in uh, engineering, electrical engineering and uh, computer science. And some of the plots you'll see he used with his software. I have, I will have references for all this at the end of the presentation. So in the mid 1980s, Brian Austin, Zeta 6 BKW ran in a computer analysis to develop an antenna system for the maximum number of HF bands possible that would permit a low standing wave ratio without an antenna tuner. Uh, with a 50 ohm coax cable as the main feed line. Identified a range of lengths which, when combined with matching ladder line, would provide this characteristic. Now, according to an acknowledgement expert in computer engineering design, uh, LBC, but while the G5 antenna sy system cousins, the ZS6 BKW antenna system has come closest to achieving the goal that is part of the G5 RV mythology and multi band HF antenna consisting of a single wire and simple matching system that covers many of the HF bands. Both are good antennas and will work well in defined situations. Now, this presentation is not designed to bash a G5 RV, but to possibly convince you or a new ham, and I'll stress new ham because that's how this project started, to enjoy the benefits of lower SWR, lower loss, and greater signal strength by using the later line version of the ZSP Now, here's uh, the model and the geometry of the two antennas. <clears throat> You're typically on the left here, you are G5 RV is 101 feet across. It will be a little bit shorter in an inverted V manner. And your height is 28.52 feet. And that's with 450 ohm ladder line. The difference with the ZSX BKW is it's actually, the dipole is actually shorter of 93.8 feet. And the ladder line is closer to 39, 40 feet. These lengths will differ a little bit depending on whether you're using a flat top or using an inverted V to get more of an omnidirectional pattern. And objects in the area of where you, you know, put these antennas up may change the characteristics. So when you do put the antenna up, you may want to put it on an antenna analyzer or your radio and fine tune it for your installation. Maybe shorten it up a little bit, lengthen it up a little bit just to uh, dial it into where your, you know, <clears throat> where it works best for you. So at the bottom we can see it's 70.3 feet shorter and 11 feet longer. So <clears throat> one of the things to consider is antenna patterns above the ground. Let's look at a typical 40 meter dipole antenna pattern versus the height above the ground. As you can see, uh, 40 meter dipole, it's six feet above ground. You're more of in the red here, you've got more of a, 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 a pattern that shoots high uh, and does not shoot out. Okay, this is looking at the end of the antenna from the end. As you go above the ground higher, uh, maybe 12 feet, your, your, your pattern widens out and your angle of radiation gets lower. 40 uh, 40 meter dipole at 24 feet in the green here, it gets even uh, pushed out even further, the orange even further at 48 feet, and then uh, way out at a very high antenna, 65 feet. You're, you're really pushing out to a lower angle of radiation, uh, depending on where you want to work. So those are some of the things you have to consider when you put an antenna up. What What's your favorite band? I'm talking about a wire antenna now. What's your favorite band? What are you shooting for? Uh, these things will come into play, and we're going to get a little bit more into how that actually in real practice looks. So I'm going to show you some charts. 
the author picked 40 feet center height for this particular antenna. And of course the ladder line is about 40 feet. And the ends are about 27 feet high in an inverted V. So we have an angle of about 148 degrees. And it's gonna to try to give you a good omnidirectional pattern as much as possible. So let's look at the ZS6BKW antenna over the traditional G5 RV. And you can see, oops, my mouse is doing that on me. Uh, broadside off the antenna, your G5 RV versus the gain on a ZS6BKW. So the lobes are more pronounced off the side versus the ends, which is really typically where you want it. And you also look at, a, you have a lower angle of radiation or main, more gain out towards the horizon. Let's look at 40 meters. This software that was used to make these plots is looking at two different uh, gains at uh, different angles of takeoff angles. So it, on the 40 meter band at a 63 degree take, takeoff angle, uh, let's, let's back up here and you can see we're kind of centered here on the US where we are. So you can see a fairly good omnidirectional pattern on 40 meters, what, this, what, what type of gain you have at about six degrees out, minus eight dB versus 63 degrees out. And where it's more pronounced. Let's look at 20 meters where this antenna was cut for or, or is natively resonant. And you'll see the pattern changes. And this is typical not only of this particular antenna, but uh, the similar antennas, uh, multi-band dipoles, the G5RB would be the same, where you've got uh, about minus 2 dB, 2 bi in, at this takeoff angle versus a 34 degree, 34.1 degree takeoff angle, you've got about 8.51 dBi of gain. So it gives you an idea of what areas you can work on the globe here. 17 meters, something similar, but you've, you've got a lot more lobes here because this is really, it's a higher frequency. It's not really in resonance with the antenna. So you're gonna get more lobes and you can see the difference. Not quite as much gain out there, only about two and a half dBi. Uh, versus 1.1. 12 meter band. It's almost equal on both the, the takeoff angle on both, and it's it's a it's quite a pattern to take a look at. 10 meters. This is where the antenna shines because uh, the Z, the uh, G5 RV is not is not resonant on this band, nor are a lot of a lot of antennas very resonant on this band. Uh, so the ZS6 BKW works well here. You can see the lobes, you're gonna have to put up with some nulls, but of course it depends on which way the antenna is oriented. Uh, this is a, some of an inverted V. I'm gonna assume if you do turn it a little bit, you will have different lobes uh, by, off by a few degrees. Uh, I think for, this is a 20 degree swath here. So we looked at radiation angles and we looked at patterns. Let's take a look at SWR curves for this in town. The G5 RV does very well on 80 meters. Uh, you can get almost down to 1.0 one, uh, 1 um, or thereabouts, uh, down about three and a half megahertz, all the way up to 40 megahertz, it starts getting pretty high. So it's it's really not usable much above 3.65. It does, does require a tuner. The ZS6 BKW is, is probably just as bad uh, you're still going to require a tuner. However, I want to show you a chart later on where you can modify these antennas for your favorite brand and bring that down into resonance on, on a particular band that's of interest outside the normal bands where it's not tuned. On the 80 meter band, here's a typical mod where here's your ladder line to the antenna and then you put your one-to-one -one choke in there and uh, again, this, that's an option and you put a 500 picofarad a cap, door knob cap, and the center conductor going back to the shack. That will bring the antenna in tune in resonance on 80 meters. Um, let's take a look at 40 meters. The ZS6 is very resonant on 40 meters. Uh, under under three to well under three to one, you start getting into the operating band. It's about one and a half to one. 
the, the G5 RV is very high and, and does require a tuner there. And you, you will have losses at the antenna and on the feed line. We take a look at uh, what well, I mentioned earlier about modifying the antenna. When it's put up at your QTH, there's all, also going to be all kinds of little things, the, the angle of the dipole and some other things that can change the resonance of where that sets. So you can take that feed line uh, and, and change it, change the length, and you can see how changing the length of the feed line just a, just a little bit will bring that into resonance, more, more of a resonance. You just have to look at the antenna when you put it up and see where it's resonant. 30 meters, neither of the antennas are any good. Your ZS6 is way off the scale, as is uh, the G5RV. Uh, you're going to need an antenna tuner there, but there are some mods that you can bring this antenna in on 10 meters if you want, or 30 meters if you want. Let's take a look at the 20 meter band where this antenna is cut for resonance. You'll see how low it is. Uh, it's, it's, it's resonant. Uh, I'm sorry, hold on a minute. There we go. You can see where it is. Uh, let's see, I'm losing my, there we go. You can see where it is here, resonant across the band. Again, your G5RB is going to need a tuner for, for a lot of this portion here. Um, G5RB is kind of cut for resonance on 20 meters. This is the best you're going to see of it on all the bands, pretty close. Again, 20 meter, your ladder line lengths. Uh, if you change the lengths a little bit, you can see you can see what it'll do. Uh, it's not that critical, but it does help to, to play a little bit. Let's take a look at uh, 17 meter band. This antenna is very resonant on there. The G5 RV is not. Um, 15 meters, both antennas are just horrible. I'm going to need a tuner. Uh, there are mods that you can bring in, make do to make to bring this in if you love 15 meters. 12 meters. Set of six BKW is right in line with where it should be. Uh, G5 RV uh, is going to need a tuner. 10 meters. This antenna is pretty good. Uh, it covers pretty much most of the 10 meter band. Uh, Starting, you know, 28.5, you're pretty close. Um, 29.5, you're still within the area. If you play with that ladder line, you can bring it down a little bit, but it's just not that bad. Six meters. It's amazing that this antenna is resonant on the six meter band natively. Some of the best DXs out there on that six meter band. Uh, the G5 doesn't count. And then you can see how antenna height will also tune or detune this antenna. So we've kind of picked a, a nominal height of about 40 feet, which is actually the length of the ladder line for this antenna, is where it likes to dial itself in uh, right there. This is the 40 foot mark. Uh, this, this, this chart here is, is where it is, and that's pretty much where the antenna was designed. So that's an ideal height of 40 feet. It doesn't have to be there, but uh, it is ideal. So let's take a look at this NS6 BKW, and this is the optimum ultimate, ultimate antenna. However, this it had mods done to it on a specific band of interest outside the five that it's normally resonant on. Sure, your antenna tuner can tune these other bands without these mods, but if you want to keep it native, especially on 80 meters, you can throw that doorknob cap in there right here and it'll really bring it in uh, nice and low. And if you look online, you'll see different mods uh, for this, this antenna. So in summary, in our conclusions, we'll look at these two antennas, look at the bands, every time I move the mouse, it flicks on me, sorry about that. And <clears throat> you can see where natively these antennas, this is just natively without any mods that I mentioned, where these antennas are and uh, the differences in the SWR and where they come in. So it's nice, as I mentioned earlier on, it's really nice to have an antenna that's resonant as possible 
before it hits that coax coming back to the shack to reduce line losses. And I've personally had experience with different antennas where that makes a huge difference. So <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that I looked at all this and another ham that lives here, uh, Phil, K2ELV, doesn't live more than a mile or so from my house. New ham, got his G5 RV, this is in 2017. And I said to Phil, I said, you know, he's newly licensed, about to put up his first antenna. I told him about it and I showed him the differences, what I had just showed you in those, in those, uh, those charts. He said, let's do it. So we shortened the antenna, lengthened the ladder line, and put that antenna up over 40 feet in a slightly inverted V. The results were astounding. I couldn't believe it. <clears throat> Better than what I had seen in the studies. And below is a sweep of Phil's antenna. Uh, these are the um, the bands here, uh, 80 meters, 40 meters, 20 meters, um, 17 meters, uh, 15 meters again, it's not good, 12 meters, 10 meters. And Phil's going to uh, break in here, and I think we can unmute him. Um, Phil, I want to unmute you and get some comments on what this antenna has done for you and the experiences you had uh, putting it up. Can we uh, pull up Phil's name in the list here, uh, the moderator, and unmute him? Uh, yeah, he's unmuted. Okay. Oh, he pre muted. He's unmuted. All right. There we go. Okay, I got him. Go ahead, Phil. I think we might be fighting each other. <laughs> I think so. Go ahead, Phil. Phil, you've got no audio. Okay. Is there a phone a phone number that he can call in on? If you go on the um, audio panel, expand versus the little double arrows, you should be able to see a thing that lets you call in. It'll give you a PIN number, and, and they, uh, usually it's a toll-free number to call. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe you can do that, Phil. He's doing that now. I just, I just changed the telephone, so that takes a moment to get connected. Okay. Hey, Stand this by. is our first glitch this time. Compared to last month, we have plenty of. Yeah, he's, got, he's running on Linux, and uh, it may not uh, may not see his microphone, so we'll sit tight. So the modeling while we're sitting here waiting, uh, sure. Jim. Um, that, were you doing the modeling here? Uh, if so, what software were you using to do that? Uh, that model was done by the study I read that led me to this, uh, by the gentleman that's since passed away. Um, and he was using some software there, as mentioned in the very first slide, but it will be included in the last slide in the presentation. All right. So while we're waiting for Phil, I'm going to... All right. I'm gonna go ahead. Phil, try to get there we go. There. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yep. I got you. All right. Yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't let me pick an audio device. Anyway, uh, my recollection is is slightly different. Uh, I was more of the mindset. I just bought this brand new antenna. I don't want to cut it up. I just want to hang it. Would you come over and give me a hand? Jim showed up with a roll of ladder line in his soldering kit. And was like, all right, we're gonna make this longer. We're gonna we're gonna cut these down. I was a little hesitant at first, but I'm really glad I listened to him because, you know, I, I knew nothing at the time. I just, like he said, brand new ham. I just wanted to put up my antenna and play radio that weekend. I had taken that Monday off. So uh, it didn't take us all that long to do the mods. I haven't done any of the additional single band mods yet. I do plan on doing the 80 meter one. Uh, that being said, it, it tunes up on any band I try to tune up on. Uh, I really only use the tuner on 1530, 80, and 160. Uh, I don't get on 160 all that much, and SWR was, is a little high, but it, it does tune up fine with my internal tuner. I'm running a Yezu 991A. Um, in my, I'd say, two years of really actively playing HF, I've put 2,500 contacts on that antenna, uh, about 1,500 of my own personally, and then last year, uh, during 4th of July week, I was representing New York State in, as K2A in one of the uh, 
13 colony special event stations, and I did a thousand contacts that week too. So um, I never have a problem getting out. I only run 100 watts. I don't have an amp. Um, I've I've done a couple after putting a second antenna up here a year, year and a half later. Uh, I was talking to a guy online and just sort of comparing the antennas. I was switching between them and and. He said to me, my hand to God, if you didn't tell me you were switching between antennas, I would have thought you just turned on an amplifier. So I've gotten very good signal reports over the years, uh, two, about two and a half years now. So, uh, yeah. What are some of the outstanding contacts you made? Anything in particular? Oh, man. I, and I can't remember off the top of my head. I've made some, some little islands in both the South Atlantic and South Pacific. Um, you know, I've made all the typical faraway contacts people strive for, you know, the Alaskas and the uh, Australias and all those. Um, I, I really never have a problem getting through a pileup for the most part. You know, and I, I sort of thought at first, you know, did did I just get lucky? Did it Was it just the spot we put it, the angle we put everything? Was everything just happened to fall into place was perfect? But, you know, as Jim will mention, I think further on in the in the presentation, a few other people that he had mentioned it to had had put up these antennas were having great results and then i even felt confident enough uh to suggest it to somebody and help him build it uh just recently actually actually and i think i think jim's going to mention him as well we have a question here if you'd like to take one sure sure uh phil walker hi hopefully this is working yep go ahead yep, i'm yep. just curious just curious, uh, I only have room to put a G5RV Junior up, and so I don't know if you've done any similar modeling with the shorter version of that antenna. And if so, are there similar kinds of mods one could do to that antenna to, to on the bands that it does work, get better performance? Jim, you know, yes. I'll let you take that in one second. I just, I, I had meant to mention when I was talking about my antenna too that I don't live on a huge lot. I live on a small lot on East Lake Road on Canisius Lake. You know, your typical, you know, sort of city-sized lot, the half-acre lot. Um, I have one tree right next to the shack where I hang uh, the ladder line from, and then I just run the radial down towards the road and then over my shack. And because it's run, as a, mine's a kind of a sharp inverted V. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's the optimum configuration by any means, but it, it really works well, and, and it did allowed me to, to fit it on my lot. But Jim, I'll let you, you know, specifically answer his question. Yeah, and just commenting with what Phil said earlier, I, I was just surprised how well this antenna worked for him, especially getting through all the pileups he's been able to get through with just 100 watts. And one other thing that wasn't mentioned, he can tune this thing on 160 meters with his built-in antenna tuner on the radio, which is really just an antenna tuner that wants to make the radio happy. And I think the only tip will get work three to one maybe five to one on it at 991. But he does have 100 feet of uh, RG8X running to this antenna, 70 feet of which is coiled. So that may allow him to operate on um, 160. But again, uh, we try to, when you, when you have antenna native losses in the antenna, those add up when you have especially longer cable. So the fact that the antenna is native, natively resonant on a lot of bands and Phil having the, the good results that he does with this is kind of a testament to how well it works. Um, and as far as a G5 RV Junior, I see them advertised. I'm not sure how they are, but you can, if you take the difference uh, as to how that's, uh, it is in size for both the, the ladder line and the you know the uh, the dipoles you know see what percentage they're cutting that down to you should be able to apply that literally to a, you would think to this particular antenna um, and again it doesn't hurt to try you can try just about anything does that does that answer your question at least give it a try yeah I just wonder if there was any modeling or anything else that uh, had been done for the junior antenna that would uh, you know, at least give you a starting point at uh, the ZS6 equivalent. The best you can do is probably um, take what they've done on the G5 side and apply that same uh, ratio of shrinking down to the ZS6 uh, from the dimensions that we supplied here and see what happens. So do we have any other questions there, Scott? 
Um, not right now. The latter line match, is that the thing you think that is making the biggest difference, or is it the recutting yes. or both? Yeah, partially, yes. You know, when I when I built mine to, um, you know, I, I didn't even own an antenna uh, analyzer at the time. And, you know, I was just playing with the length of the ladder line, you know, folding it to make it shorter or longer, coming in, coming back into the shack and, and seeing what SWR was on the radio. I knew it was close already. I think Jim had been over with the bird watt meter earlier in the day. Um, but I just played around with it after that to really fine tune it, literally trial and error to getting it to a point, you know, that it worked well on all bands for me. Um, when I helped somebody else, when, like I said, I'm not, I know Jim's coming up to him in a few minutes when I helped him by that time I had a, an antenna analyzer and, and, you know, did everything a little bit more, you know, by the book, as opposed to just trial and error. And, and, you know, his turned out great as well. Yep. Uh, that's true. Okay. Um, so what happened about a, uh, last year, another new ham, uh, was, uh, Steve Denny. And Steve uh, had purchased a G5 RV, and we were pretty and you much... You know, Jim, it was, it was pretty much the exact same conversation that you and I had. He oh. came over here, he pulls the G5 RV out of the back of his truck, brand new, wants to hang it up, asked me if I'd give him a hand. I'm like, you know. <laughs> and then it was the exact same conversation that you and I had had uh, two, you know, a year and a half earlier. Yep. Um, and... Uh, the antenna went up just under 40 feet in inverted V, and you can see Steve's results were were very good. Um, he still wants to make that 80 meter mod to put that cap in there, but you can see from his sweep where these where these are resonant. Steve, you want to uh, chime in here as to um, your experiences, and I cannot find you on the list of users here, and I uh, maybe you can talk and see if we hear you. I know he's in there because he's raise your hand. I do you see him at all? Uh, I see you raised there, raising your hand. I Can unmuted. You Can you raise your hand, Steve? Or I, I can't see the people raising their hand. Yeah, okay. he he did. You're you're still muted, Steve. There hey, you, hey, you guys. We hear you, gentlemen, ladies. How you guys doing? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I uh, it's it's the same story that Phil told. When I told Phil about my purchase of the G5 RV, he said, ah, wait a minute. And uh, <laughs> he said, we got this thing that we're going to do to your antenna. And being a new ham, I didn't even have my general license yet before my uh, the, the antenna was put up. So Phil came over with his antenna analyzer. Uh, I think we set it up at his house first because he had the... Uh, a height, uh, he had the, it all stringed up in the tree first, and uh, we got it situated there and then brought it to my house. Did a, a few little modifications. I think uh, we didn't get quite 40 feet, right around 38, 39. Uh, did some ladder line adjustments, some radial adjustments, and uh, the results have been amazing. I don't have anything to compare it to, but I don't. I didn't need to buy another antenna. Um, I've hit Australia. Um, I think I've worked all states, South Africa, tons of times, uh, all of Europe. A hundred watts in a fifty-dollar wire. That's about it. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I was uh, impressed. Uh, how are how's it doing pileups for you? I don't know if it's my voice or the antenna. <laughs> I get right through, Jimbo. I get through pretty well. I uh, I do have a beam antenna now. Um, I took down. I, I'm, I think I'm going to get a different one, but I really hardly need it. it this antenna is just, it's been amazing. Uh, I, I've, I've heard other people having a lot of problems getting out. Um, I, I Not only do I get out well, I receive equally as well, I would say. So it's, it's it was definitely worth the modifications. I do have a G5 RV Junior that I was going to use for um, just playing around. I, I haven't even put it up. I, I, uh, I bought it for uh, field day use or I'm always in the woods, bring a, an antenna launcher out there and I'll, I'll see what I can do with the G, uh, G5 RV Junior. 
see if I can, uh, <laughs> I don't think it's gonna get close to what this antenna does, but there's gotta be some modification to uh, the tested gentleman asking questions about the junior. There's gotta be a, a modification you can get a little bit better results, but I, I don't think there's anything that comes close to this. And you can tune it to your needs, really. Um, as Jim mentioned, the doorknob, I think I'm going to put a 750 picofarad uh, cap in there uh, where you want it tuned uh, the best on 80 meters. Depends on uh, what cap you use. You can use 500, um, 7, 750, I think. They went up to a thousand picofarad, so uh, I'll let everybody know when that uh, modification happens. Let me ask a question to both you, Steve and Phil. What are your noise levels on this antenna? My biggest complaint is noise. I threw up a, an NFET half wave here, and it's the noisiest antenna I've ever used in my life. How's the, how's the noise level for you guys? What do you typically see on 40 and 80 meters there? Very low for me. Um, unless you know what I, I see the same about same amount of noise level if you hear somebody else complaining about noise level you know my noise level will be up um, but but not indirectly if, it, if it's affecting everybody else it's affecting me so my noise level isn't always high or always low it's uh, I, I haven't had a complaint about noise level on my side go ahead Phil yeah I'll, I'll pretty much say the same thing there you know I don't I don't have a lot to compare it to. I've just started putting up other HF antennas here. So I've got the NFED here and my noise level on the ZS6 is definitely lower. Um, and I have a couple of times with, with, um, not with Steve, with a couple other people um, just kind of asked, you know, hey, what's your noise level on this, you know, frequency now? And, and you know, I do seem to be a little lower. And again, I know there's a lot of other variables involved there, but um, for, for me, it's been acceptable. I, I've never, I've never left and said, "Oh my God, the noise is killing me." Sure, there's, there's nights now and then, but overall and generally speaking, it's, it's, it's decent. Yeah, I'll agree. I've been to Phil's house and it's his noise levels uh, much better than mine. Okay, well, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, one other uh, ham who could not make it this evening, uh, Ken KU2US at the south end of the lake, his antenna went down, and uh, I told him about this antenna. And he went out and put it up, and he says it's the best antenna he's ever used in his entire amateur career, if you want to call it that. So he's been very happy with it also. Um, the next project is uh, the W5GI Mystery Antenna. And this thing can be made from a 300-ohm ladder line. You can do 450 if you want. Uh, makes for a great light, portable field day antenna. And you can run it in a dipole fashion or an inverted V, of course. They call it a mystery antenna because they have problems modeling this antenna and they can't figure out why it works so well natively. And it has um, some stubs in here, collinear, makes it a collinear matching stubs that change the phase uh, between these, these sections, radiating sections. And you actually get uh, gain on this antenna on 20 meters. Again, it's cut for 20 meters natively. And um, it, it's a low profile collinear co uh, coaxial array antenna. Covers 80 through 6 meters again. But look at these uh, SWR readings. They're even slow, they're even lower than the ZS6 BKW on all the bands. So this is, is another antenna that's definitely worth trying out. And uh, even for portable field they use. There's a, a design here, and we'll make sure this, this PowerPoint presentation gets published uh, on your IRS site. But here's the here's the, the build sections for it. You can even buy the buy this these antennas. They're out there. I'll put a link on a company that sells all these antennas if you don't want to build it. And you can see uh, you know what the lengths are. Uh, the gentleman who was looking for the uh, the G5 Junior. Now I don't know what your what your horizontal uh, width is for an antenna. Obviously, you know these are around 100 feet, but you, if you drop them down, you're, you're, you can probably get down to 75 feet. This one is only 28 and a half feet tall. So if you don't have the height, you can certainly try an antenna like this. And this again works 80 through 6 meters. So just to sum it up, um, I. I through a, there's a comment on radio reference 
a guy did a comparison of a G5 RV flat top at 40 feet. Um, and he made some differences here. On 80 meters, the signal strength was uh, 2S units stronger. This is the ZS6 versus the, versus the uh, G5. 40 meters, 2S units stronger. Noticeable difference on receive. Um, CW140 was better with the other antenna. 20 meters, uh, it says this is where it shines. Um, I'm sorry, this is, this is, I'm not the ZS6. This is the, this is the, uh, the mystery antenna uh, where it really started to shine. It's a six low pattern. He sees a consistent two to four S units of difference over the G5 RV. Uh, and 17 meters doesn't do very well. Uh, it's going to need to tune that. 15, 12, 10, tunes well here. Uh, the G5 doesn't tune at all. So his conclusion was the mystery antenna tunes quicker than the G5 RV. The noise floor is two to three S units quieter in some bands. Uh, wire antenna construction tips, I'll put them in the presentation for you. Uh, making your own antenna, the hints about wire type of insulators, ladder line, coax feeds. Um, you can see a little bit about your ladder line feed line. Uh, you, the thing if you're using feed line is you have to keep it uh, away from metal objects. At least three to six inches. I, I like at least a foot, um, especially, you know, anything that's long, it's going to interfere with the radiation pattern. I've also included a uh, coax loss chart. If you remember my one of my beginning slides, loss on types of cable through the cable coupled with poor antenna SWR, those losses can add up by the time it gets to your radio. And this is a reference, uh, these are all the links that were referenced in this presentation that I've read through that led me to where we were today. And those will be available. And I'd like to hear from anybody that's uh, put these antennas and decided to build these antennas. I'd love to hear back from you as to what your, what your experiences are. And I think that's it. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it back to Scott, and we'll open up for any questions. Hey, go ahead and uh, raise your hand up if you have a question. I know we sold a couple of uh, these the G5 RVs at the auction, so I'd be interested, interested if anybody in the group here purchased one of those to play with. Uh, John, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Jim, I have a question for you. At the early part of your presentation, you mentioned a Carolina Wyndham. I've had one up now for 20 years. Unfortunately, it's not up anymore. Came down a couple of months ago. And have you made any comparisons between that and the ZS6? I have not. Life, no live comparisons, but there are. I believe there are some online comparisons, especially with the antenna patterns. You can. Uh, there is a, some charts I've seen of the Carolina Wyndham. Uh, there's a comparison chart on some of these links you go to. And they do. There's one that does cover the Carolina Wyndham on it. Um, so okay. this, the Carolina Wyndham is a great antenna, but it's a very heavy antenna, as you can imagine. It's made out of coax, and it right. has a valen at the top. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you can put one of these up, it's definitely worth a try. Yeah, I have it connected with three uh, a group of three trees. Uh, the center part is pretty close to the trunk. I don't have my teeth in, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, it's connected near the trunk, so it's really supported well, but it's been up there a long time. It's been a very good antenna, uh, but since I have an inverted V uh, with a trap dipole, um, I've been using that. So I said, well, I'll wait until the weather gets a little nicer and then I'll, I'll put it back up. But after hearing your talk about the ZS6, I said, gee, I wonder, if I should go in that direction or not, you know? It's up to you, you know, you have a trap diet pull. I don't know what bands it's natively resonant on, but that's a, that's a good performing antenna. Yeah, 40 and 80. Okay, so you've got some, yeah. you've got some, some real estate to put something like that up. Oh yeah, I've got nine acres over here, no problem. Sure. Uh, well, well, I was just, I was just curious because I, I figured instead of repairing this other guy, which has been in the weather for a long time. Maybe, uh, you know, for whatever years I have left, I might as well try something new. Well, it's a cheap antenna. And, you know, if, if you 
want to put it up and I'd be interested to see how well it compares to the other antenna, but it's, it's certainly okay. worth trying. Very good. Thanks a lot. Sure. Blair, Blair Anderson. Yeah, um, I just have a quick question about if I have an opportunity to mount the G five RV horizontal, is that preferable to inverted to or a V implementation or not? Well, if you would go back to the uh, the antenna patterns, you're going to see what you're going to get on a uh, an antenna that's a dipole. You're going to get more of a uh, bidirectional pattern off the sides. You're not going to get a omnidirectional pattern. So if you're interested in in uh, nulling out some areas, uh, you're definitely going to do it if you keep it as a, a flat top. Uh, you know, the, the the ends that it's pointing to are going to be nulled, and it's going to radiate off the side. Um, if you want more of an omnidirectional pattern, you're going to want to put this on a, a more of an inverted V. And uh, typically, you don't want to go anything greater than or anything you know worse than a 148 degrees. If you if you start getting that that V too tight, you're going to run into problems. But it's just a compromise to get yourself more of an omnidirectional pattern. That's all. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Dennis O'Donnell. Hi, Jim. Um, um, back to the uh, ZSX. Um, I've got the length and the height to to do what you're describing. But the only way I could do that is within a bunch of trees. Uh, they're, they're, they have high canopies, but so it would be within a bunch of trees. Um, any thoughts uh, on how it would work within trees as opposed to out in the open? I'm going to talk here. Phil talked to you about that because his antenna is buried in trees. Right. Phil, go right ahead. Yeah, I was just going to speak up. Yeah, mine, mine runs up about a foot and a half off the trunk. You know, my ladder line runs about a foot and a half off the trunk of the the tall tree and then my radial that goes down towards the road just runs through all trees i just i had a tree guy come and trim branches just so i had a just so i could get the ropes in place and that's what i do i have a couple of ropes in place on various trees right now so that you know the that radial runs right down through a whole bunch of of trees uh the other one runs over my garage through literally right through a willow tree so uh hasn't affected hasn't affected my performance at all and, you know, another thing I forgot to mention, I live where the winds blow right up off the lake. My my antenna has withstood 60 mile an hour winds on multiple occasions. Uh, and and never, I haven't the only problem, the ropes break before the antenna does. So it's it's been down once in about three years just due to the ropes breaking, but easy to put back up. There That's was also news. a uh, um, article, I think it was in last spring sometime in, the, in QST about trees and modeling antennas and what effects the foliage has and when it doesn't have foliage and stuff like that. I mean, want to see if you could find that. Um, I would tell you what issue it's in, except it's at the office and I'm not there, so. Yeah, and of course, that, you know, that's where if you've got a lot of foliage and they get wet uh, and it's soaking wet maybe, or even if you got ice, your antenna tuner may help with some of that. Uh, but the point is to try to get these antennas natively resonant as possible before it hits that tuner, or hits that coax. Okay, we have a question from uh, Gary Acker. Yes, uh, I actually have a couple, couple questions. First of all, um, as far as the tuner is concerned, uh, I do not have a tuner at this point, so I would have the option of, of uh, getting one of those balance tuners, which would actually connect to the um, to the to, to the uh, ladder line, or a tuner that would go on the on the shack end of the of the uh, coax. So, is there any any advantages one way or the other? Yeah, this particular antenna will does not does not lend itself to having because a balance line itself is part of the radiator on this thing. You don't okay. want to do that. So, you want in fact you want to be honest with you. Reading people's comments about 60 feet of coax, uh, RG8 is, is really makes this antenna sing. Okay. Don't know why. It, it may be part of maybe part of the way it tunes itself. I, mm -hmm. I, I, can't, I can't verify one way or the other. Uh, Phil's got like Phil's got about 100 feet. And he can do, he can do uh, eight, 160 meters on it. So 
Yeah, well, it, and I've got, uh, I've got, I would say, of the coax, it's uh, LMR 400, but I've got about 70 feet. Uh, well, that's more than, more than sufficient for uh, HF. Okay. Probably kind uh, of overkill. Yeah, well. And it's, but it's helping him to use, yeah. you know, helping him with a, with a simple in-band radio or in, in tuner that's built into the radio. The extra coax is helping him tune 160 meters. Right. Uh, okay. But, so the other the other question then is uh, the inverted V versus the flat top. My uh, my the way the trees are, I've got uh, the radiators connected to the ends of uh, two different trees, um, and the uh, where the center feed is is just in the air. There's there's no support. Uh, so it's pretty much flat top. There is a slight um, angle on it, but not much. I'm maybe five feet different mm. from from one end to the other. Uh, and you're saying that that basically is less omnidirectional. If you if it's you did bidirectional. It's basically it's basically bidirectional off the sides, or okay. on, the lower, on the lower frequencies, probably around 40 or 80 meters. You're going to get a lot of sky wave off the top of the antenna. Okay. All right. Okay, good. Yeah, I imagine that the, the inverted V pattern starts to act a little more like a vertical, the sharper the V is. Right. So it's gonna change both the, the planar pattern, or the polar pattern, yeah. as, as well as the takeoff angle. Yeah, and there's a chart in here on height above ground, so you can see uh, the lower and the lower antennas, you're gonna have more of a, uh, radiation pattern that shoots up um, versus when yeah. you get this moved out. My height is uh, between 45 and 50 feet. So. Okay. So, you know, you're probably right in here, but again, it's gonna, this is gonna be off the sides of the antenna. Right. Okay, versus versus the ends, so. Any other okay, questions? We an, we've got another one here from Parth. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Um, hey, Jim. Um, so, you know that uh, I'm in the apartment, right? So, in the apartment, I'm thinking of uh, setting up, uh, you know, um, an HF uh, kind of solution. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm thinking whether I should go for a mag loop. I think we had this conversation pr previously, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, exactly convinced, you know, that the mag loop is easy to build or you know, uh, affordable either because I looked at prices there, you know, very high. So is there any antenna that you think uh, or anybody else in the group thinks that it might be easier uh, to set up in a balcony kind of situation uh, where it'd be easy to use? Mag loops are very popular. You can use them with a limited amount of power, very noise, uh, very, very um, low noise, obviously. Um, they work the magnetic plane versus the electrical, but uh, you can look at wire antennas called stealth antennas. If you just do a Google search, there's a ton of designs for stealth antennas out there that you can end feed. Uh, the thing is, again, you've got to get them away from the building. So uh, you can, another popular antenna is a mobile antenna. Um, they have the antennas that will tune uh, for the for a mobile, if you were putting them on a car and you can mount them on a railing, if I don't know if your balcony has a railing or whatever, you know they're about the problem is they're about minus 12 dB gain typically, but they will work. And buddy poles are very popular if you can, if you can get those uh, in a dipole fashion mm -hmm. off a tripod. So there's some options there for you. I think I got um, one I, of those. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I was saying I think I have space to mount on the railing. Um, and that is possible. Um, I just didn't know if, uh, you know, I, uh, how much power I could push to one of those because my uh, IC718 can push 100 watts. So uh, the previous time, uh, you know, I tried uh, doing something like this back in India. I designed my own uh, dipole uh, antenna um, and that was, uh, you know, uh, fixed to a point where it was like almost like a inverted V kind of situation and it was very, like there was a lot of space to work with, and I knew that the wire could take the power. But in, in this situation, you could, try, it, uh, you could try the body poles if, if you have a little space for them. Uh, basically, they're a dipole, but they're wound. They're wound, so they're shortened. Right. Or, 
or a, a mobile antenna um, that you know would attach to the railing. But again, these have to be designed for some type of limited counterpoise or ground. Mm -hmm. Are you going to say something? I was going to say, uh, be careful with the loops and power. Um, yeah. uh, the way that they operate, the capacitor end can have pretty significant voltages depending on power. You know, with 100 watts going into it, it's going to probably kick a kilovolt to 1.5. So they're specially designed. You sh you'll see a lot of the designs will have vacuum capacitors in them. Uh, I have an MFJ, and it's got a very large uh, spaced out capacitor to deal with the, the voltage stuff. Uh, MFJ also has an apartment antenna that, but it requires you to tune the counterpoise too, depending on what band you're in, uh, that you can stick on a railing and hang off at an angle. Uh, I bought one of those when I first started off. It, it's kind of marginal, but it does at least get you on the air. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, how about another question from uh, Jeremy Gaynor? Uh, yeah, I just actually have a comment uh, for the guy who has the uh, the railing. Number one, I have the question is, your railing metal? Uh, the, yes, it is metal. Okay. I have seen people who are using things that are made by Tar Heel. Um, Yesu makes one as well. That's actually for their radios, uh, where you can actually use the internal uh, tuner. Um, that's called the ATAS uh, 120. And that one is rated for going up to 100 watts. Um, Tar Heel makes them anywhere from 100 all the way up to. I think it's 500 watts. Don't quote me on that. Um, and they're called screwdriver antennas. Those are the mobile antennas, I believe, that Jim was trying to refer to. And what it is is when you tune them, they actually go up and down um, to get resident or the lowest S uh, SWR for it. The problem is is that you have to have really good grounding. When you're putting them onto a vehicle, you have to make sure that all of your body parts, that means the trunk lid, the body, maybe even your exhaust, the hood, everything has to be grounded. So they use grounding straps. So when you're doing it to a uh, balcony railing, you're having to make sure that the contact for that is really well done. You need to grind off a little bit of paint if, there's, if they're painted or whatever um, to be able to make sure that it's well grounded. Uh, to answer Scott with the QST, uh, with the trees and uh, antenna gain, there was a QST issue. It was in February of 2018. The name of the issue is called The Truth About Trees and Antenna Gain. And it's on. it starts on page 33. Um, and you can find that if you're an ARRL member, uh, you can actually get that through their digital editions right through their website. Um, that's all I have. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It's good good advice. I saw somebody else had their hand up and took it down. Okay. Oh, thanks. Jeremy again. You're muted yourself, Jeremy, if you want to talk. Uh, no, I, like I said, I was done. I just took, took my uh, hand down. Oh, okay. So at this point, the only thing I can tell you is uh, if you're interested in getting a little bit better performance out of your quote all band uh, antenna. This is because uh, a couple of alternatives to look at here and I'd be very interested in hearing your results of the feedback. Uh, okay. on these I got a question from Peter Fornia. Go ahead, uh, Peter. I, a little bit late, uh, Jim, but uh, um, the question regarding the, uh, the or orientation of the ladder line and, and coax, um, I think everything I'm seeing looks like it's vertical. What, what's, what if it's horizontal or part of it is vertical, part of it is horizontal? I, I know um, this, is, this has been, it, depending, if you're running a flat top, you could probably run this ladder line up to 45 degrees. Uh, if you're, I guess if you're an inverted V, you could go perpendicular away from the antenna. And it, it may alter the irradiation pattern a little bit, but it shouldn't have anything to do with the way it's matched. Um, up to 40, yeah, I can get the height. If it's a ladder line, it's supposed to be about 40, 40 feet or so. Height is 40 feet, so that implies, well, it's not vertical. Up to 45 feet, you're saying, and that gets the coax off the ground into the air and, and into the shack, much, much more convenient for me. Sure. Yeah, but you can again. You can run it at a, if you want to run the ladder line back towards your house because you don't have the vertical height available to you. 
uh, you can certainly do that and run it back on an angle. I got big trees. I can I can I can put adjustments at each end sure. <laughs> and adjust the height for the whole thing. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Thanks, Jim. Nice presentation. Thank you. Any other questions? John. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you covered my question or not, Jim. But how would this work? I have a a tower with a tri bander on it. And mm -hmm. if I put a stub out, could I run that uh, ladder line within like three or four feet of that tower to Absolutely. the ground? Yeah, we've seen that done. People do that with it with the G5 all the time. Um, you know, give it a try. I, they they claim that you know you get that ladder line out away from that. That I mean that that tower is a big surface area, okay? Uh -huh. But it's certainly not going to hurt to try it. Let's okay. Performances. Would, is, is three or four feet sufficient, would you say? Yeah, that's what I would do. Three to okay. four feet. Very good. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> uh, Blair that's Anderson. An, that's an opportunity to put a couple of twists into the ladder line. Right. To, um, yeah, Brian yeah. brings up a very good point. Um, anything that I put up, I twist the ladder line. I do who? always and trees and ladder line and any other antennas don't make a good union as a rule right but uh well, if you can avoid, knock the noise down yeah if you can avoid trees uh it's a good idea yeah and it does and scott says it'll knock that wind noise down that's true or just to, to, electrically it knocks it down the twist as well thank uh, you Drew. yeah Where i just had question? one yeah. quick additional question on the on the Ladder line. Uh, how important is it? Be s straight at whatever angle you take it off. Can it? Can you change that? Like I've got to run mine through the through the side through my upper part of my house and then back down into the shack. Is that a problem, or well, should I, should I try to bring that, it in you later? You don't want that at the end of that ladder line anywhere near your house. I mean, you can, all right, but you're going to have all kinds of stray energy there. Uh, coming off the bottom you're going to probably want to use an isolator it depends on how much coax you're going to run in uh it, I, I look at steve steve's is steve your your ladder lines right down the side of your house right for about 15 20 feet oh wow i don't know if he's still on uh if you look at some of his his photos his ladder line is there um and he's yeah, probably saw, still down but yeah i saw that i Currently, I'm running mine in right through an upstairs um, window, and then yeah, down yeah. to the first floor. Yeah, I would not do that with this type this type of antenna, okay. not at all. All right, I'll try to get it all outside then. Yeah, because that's right. part of the match. That's part of the matching section of this antenna. Okay. Versus, Thanks. versus say a uh, balanced antenna where you're running the the ladder line right to the right to the tuner on a balanced feed. Uh, totally different design. Okay, very good. I was wondering, Steve. Jim, if the ladder line is twisted, that's going to change the angle that the transmission line operates at continuously along the twist. Does that interact with the other elements of the antenna? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. There's there's currents that this sets up, okay? And I wish I had, there, there's a slide, if you go to one of those couple of those web pages, there's a slide showing the currents of the antenna on each of the bands. Um, and it's in interesting how the currents set themselves up on the ladder line and the dipole. It's different for each band. They, I, the, I the, antenna, the antenna actually prevents, operates differently. It's different characteristics on these different bands. I just turn one turn for every 12 or 15 feet. That's not it's, too always bad. Work, it's worked good for me. Yeah, that's not too bad at all. Dick Gosley has a comment, uh, Scott, if you didn't recognize him. Just looking down here, let's see under, there we go. Go ahead, Dick. Hey, Jim, uh, quick comment. I've been running the G5 RVs since about 1990. And I think I made the same mistake that everybody did when they first put them up. Cut the coax to make it fit nice conveniently 
right to the radio and no problems. And then the dang thing wouldn't work on 15 meters. Of course, it doesn't work too well anyway. But anyway, put the coax back that I took out. Lo and behold, it worked fine on 15 meters. Yeah, I noticed in your chart, you showed 66 feet or more. That's guaranteed right. 66 feet or more. If you shorten it, 15 meters will be a bear and you'll never make it. Yeah, and try to use a low loss coax or, or good quality. So you're right on there, Dick. Yeah, right. I got our G8X. What does that loop do electrically? Because I've seen other designs where you have to have 10 turns at a foot diameter or something like that of coax. Sure. Yeah, actually, believe it or not, if you buy the G5 RV from DX Engineering, their their build specifications show eight to 10 turns of cable right at the base of the antenna. And it's to get the stray RF off the off the outside of the coax. Is it kind of like a, like a choke? It's kind of like a, like a choke, yeah, okay. Yeah, we used to, we used to I say- I that at the top of my tower too. Instead of a ballon, I just put a choke, wire choke, and it works good. Yeah, you can get these one-to-one -one isolators out there. Yeah. Jim, are you ex-law enforcement by any chance? Yeah, 20 plus years. Okay, that, that explains a lot, okay. Can you tell from his designs? Yeah, I was wondering about that. I got a few people in my family who were had a lot of time uh, on the job too, so it would just pique my curiosity, but well, thank you. Another era. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're all 20 year guys too, so they put in a lot of time on the job. I don't see any additional questions. Anybody else wanna put their hand up here? Nice job, Jim. Kim, President, do you wanna say anything? Yeah, I guess uh, I'm gonna make a, a final comment about wire antennas in general. We had a presentation in, let's see, 2019, 2018, probably in 2018, um, Bob Cars, K2OID, and Bob is a uh, DX Century member. So he's uh, he's made contacts all over the world over the course of uh, 20 years or so. And one of his comments, getting to the point, one of his comments was that he made a huge number of those contacts before he got a beam and before he had an amplifier. So that kind of goes back to Stephen's comment that. Uh, you know, he, he had the beam, but that the wire antenna has been performing almost as well. Um, so there's been a lot. I think Jim's presentation proves very well that even seemingly simple wire antennas keep improving and people keep coming up with new designs. And it's a great way to get around the world on on a really small budget. Thanks, Jim, for uh, the explanation, and even more so for the q and I think that really helps people out a lot to be able to get their questions answered right away. Yeah, thank you, and I want to thank Phil and Steve who really put this thing into practice over the last couple of years, especially Phil has got well over 2,500 contacts on this, and the results he's had is just incredible. Best I've seen in all my years on ham radio. Well, with that, Thanks again to the presenters, the commentators, and uh, and of course to Scott for continuing to orchestrate all of this. I think that's it, unless anyone else has anything else. Scott? No, I don't. Uh, very good presentation, Jim. I think everybody appreciates it. I know I certainly do. Absolutely. And thanks for taking the time, and thanks, everybody, for joining tonight. And I uh, hope to see you in June. We'll let you know about the meeting. I'm kind of excited about uh, about doing an extra meeting here. So I think this has been working out pretty well. Excellent uh, Jim, presentation. Jim, quick, quick question. Do we have testing on campus, uh, um, you know, maybe next month or remotely? Because I know uh, that uh, the FCC recently has authorized uh, remote testing. So uh, are we or Rara doing um, any sort of uh, testing remotely? Because I know no. at least a few people who won't do it. Not at, not at this point in time. Uh, it, and you, it, Tim made a presentation about that earlier. And 
There's the Laurel be... VEC met and they decided not to do it at this time. Right. I know the ARLA and the FCC has been working on stuff and there's been a number of articles about it, but Laurel VEC is the one who runs it. And uh, up to I, don't know if, I don't know if uh, Sam or, or one of our newest hands, uh, he mentioned um, that he, uh, I don't know if he's still in, in the presentation here, um, KD2 TVB, but I think he said he did his license testing online. Uh, considering it's online, if you have another club someplace who is actually doing it, you might be able to do it with him. Yeah. All right. So yeah. I'll, I'll leave the uh... we, you may be able to find another club to do it, but at the moment, between RIT being closed and out the VEC that we work with not permitting online testing, um, we're not supporting it right now. I mean, yeah. I, I think there's special provisions for the both the training and how you're supposed to administer the test. Somehow mm -hmm. they're dealing with those I, actually. I, Go ahead. Actually, I was going to say you might want to check out W5YI. I know that they've been doing some online testing, and I believe that might be where they have done some of that. I believe they only did a pilot program with California, and I don't think it's widespread yet. This is Tim, education. I spoke with a Laurel uh, representative from uh, CIARC, and he said, uh, believe it or not, the paperwork and the logistics of implementing the remote testing are so complicated that that's why many uh, VEs, uh, the 14 VEs, uh, VECs, they do not want to get involved in that with the money exchange and the, the security that they're, you're just going to have to wait. So as I said, the February uh, uh, field day, uh, CIARC plans on testing down in Canandaigua. Sure. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll try to um, refer people uh, nearby over there because uh, i know at least maybe one or two people who want to take the test uh, at least for the technician class uh if you if those that want to be tested uh if you want to send an email, an email to uh, education at rochesterham.org and i will see if i can make some special arrangements uh with our ve group but uh, it's not going to be uh in in the next week or so, I, uh, we might be able to do something special if we have uh, people that uh, are really ready to take their test, not just wannabes, but really proficient at online testing. Uh, we may be able to uh, get some uh, VEs together to do some uh, social spacing uh, local testing. Where there's no guarantee to it at this point. Sure, sure, we can I'll find, find a place to do it. Um, you know, maybe uh, we'll get back to you guys. Thank you. Uh, David Carlson, you had a question. Well, not hearing a question from David. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about it. I know, um, as far as I know, the Rock City Net Ham Fest is still going on in August. And uh, last year we had testing there, so that may be another opportunity, but we'll have to see what happens. Of course, that does mean you have to wait till August. I'm not. I'm not sure if uh, Alexander, the Batavia Hamfest, has made a decision uh, yet whether they're going to do testing or not. I didn't see it in their brochure. That one's on July 18th. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, uh, David, if you did want to ask a question, you're self-muted right now. So you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well, go ahead. Okay, not hearing any more questions. Um, I guess I'll, adjourn, I'll move to adjourn the meeting. George M Masney wants to know if uh, the presentation is going to be on YouTube. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry, I just taken my headset out for the meeting. Um, yeah, I was just going to say you can sign up through the Alaska group. Uh, we had a fellow here in Genesee County that took his technician and uh, a couple weeks later his general online. Thank you. So Dave. There's, there's no issues with region then. 
Apparently not. I mean, it's like any other VEC. Okay, Tim, you want to adjourn? Uh, this has been excellent. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I say look yeah. at the website. We'll have the stuff posted up for this last one. I also have a movie up for the DMR presentation that was very good. Uh, and we'll have the slides up there too in the next couple of days. I've been a little behind with the website in the past few days. Uh, Scott, when do you anticipate having the e blast out for uh, the uh, fusion uh, on the 16th? I just did it tonight, but I don't have a sign up yet. Okay. Do you have a Do you have a link at this point? No, I have to see Brian for that. It's his. Uh, yeah, I just said to see the website for the okay. link. I'll post it on the front page as soon as we have it. Thanks. I think that the um, one thing about the academies that's I think is kind of impressive is in the past we've been doing movies with um, you know just by recording with a camera and the audio quality has been just frankly awful. Um, the quality here with the electronic stuff is really good, and the materials have been good. Um, so you know, I encourage you if you've got some time, and I know they do tend to be two hours long, uh, but there's a lot of good information there, and I hope people take advantage of it over time. We're in a new kind of education here. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how it works out. Hey, we get to see Brian's smiley face. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and then wrap her up then for the evening. Thanks everybody for coming, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you all later. Thanks, Scott. Uh, quick Thanks, quick question. Sure. Uh, what time are we going to do the board meeting tomorrow night? Uh, Tim. Uh, we were talking about we... moving it up, but. We usually um, do six, six again. Yeah, I think we did six last week, last month. Six thirty. Six is fine by me. It's I'm uh, home right now, so. Oh yeah, I think we actually pushed it back for a couple of the commuters. So I'll I'll send an email to everyone right now proposing six. And as I'll long as no one, later. It's no one as long as no one box at it, we'll do six. Okay. I think we agreed on six last time. There's also anybody, that. I mean, we've gone down about half or less of what we had before. If anybody wants to join, they're certainly welcome to. Just email the webmaster and I'll send you a link as a guest. Okay, well, Thanks, it's been fun. We'll talk to you all later.